Light one candle to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel. God fulfills the promise. Light two candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall feed the flock like a shepherd. Gently lead them homeward. Light three candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. Lift your heads and lift high the gateway for the King of Glory. Light four candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He is coming, tell the glad tidings. Let your light be shine. Our first lesson today comes from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of the kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord for the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be the one of peace. The word of God. Now join me in the psalm reading for today. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For you, Lord, have looked with favor on your holy servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me. And holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit. Casting down the mighty from their throne and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of your servant Israel to remember. The promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. The word of God. A reading from Hebrews. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sin offering you take no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, See, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Young Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Have you ever wanted to run for the hills? Not, I think all of us have at one time or another. Run for the hills. Either somebody caught you doing something you didn't want people to catch you doing, or maybe it was the first time you signed papers for a mortgage. And then you got home and you looked at the budget and you realized that the first of the next month you needed to make that payment. And you wanted to run for the hills. All of us can remember that first house if you were privileged enough to be able to buy a house. How we shopped for the best rate. How we made sure we got exactly the house we could afford. Stretched our budget. And then finally you get home and you think about 29 years and 10 months and you want to run for the hills. You're in the middle of a call process. I want to tell you something. I've known a lot of pastors who've accepted a call from a congregation. There's great excitement about it. Congregation interviews pastors. They hear pastors preach. The pastors make a visit. Their spouse comes along with them. She's very excited about coming here. You gather as a congregation and issue a call. The call's received and accepted. And then all of a sudden she thinks to herself, what did I just do? Cornelius, North Carolina, of all places. And they want to run for the hills. Or maybe you want to run for the hills as a congregation. Mary ran for the hills. It's exactly what the Bible tells us. She had found out that she was to be the mother of God. The angel Gabriel appeared to her told her what God had in store for her. She'd been greeted by that angel, had received that word. She was chosen by God to bear God's son to the world, to be the mother of the one who would come into the world. And she received this charge with grace and humility. And maybe it's true that she was experiencing that first change in her body that only moms who are pregnant can tell us about and that all of a sudden made sense to her. And she ran for the hills to the country of Judea, to the home of her good friend Elizabeth, who, if you'd been here, if you've heard those lessons in evening prayer, you knew that her husband, Zechariah, had heard the promise that Elizabeth was going to bear a child, and this was an old couple, and Zechariah didn't believe it at first, and so he wasn't able to speak, so I bet Elizabeth was happy to have somebody to talk to. And along came Mary, who went to see her cousin Elizabeth, who she needed to help her make sense out of what was going on. We Lutherans have had a very uneven relationship with Mary. We know that we don't pray to her and we Lutherans don't want anything in any way to ever detract from the full sufficiency of, of Jesus Christ, not even Mary. But we know, but we also know that we have a trust in God's design. 
But we also know that all of the wonderful, gracious, humble, faithful women who have walked the face of the earth, and there are many, she was the one that God chose to bear God to the world. And in that line of faithful women, Mary's at the head of the line. We know that about Mary. Because Mary was told by God through the angel how she fit into God's plan for the world. How she fit as the bearer of God to the world. Wouldn't it be great to have an angel come and tell you that? <laughs> how you fit into God's plan for the world? And how I fit into God's plan for the world? I sometimes wonder about it. It would be nice to talk to Gabriel about what exactly God has in mind for me. You know, I listen to TV preachers every so often. I, they're quite talented, quite capable of keeping people's attention. There aren't a lot of people snoozing when the TV preacher is on. And one of the themes I oftentimes hear from TV preachers is uh, God has a plan for you. Have you heard that? God has a plan for you. It's told in a very compelling way. And it really engages the audience. It engages me. But what often disappoints me in those sermons, and I don't want to be critical because you can be plenty critical of my sermons too, but what often disappoints me is I wonder, well, well what exactly is that plan? What, what exactly is that plan? I'd like to know. We Lutherans have spent a long time trying to answer that question about what God's plan is for us. We call it vocation. We call it vocation. That God does have a plan for us, and it's vocation. And Frederick Buechner describes vocation this way. It is where my great joy and the world's great need meet. My great joy and the world's great need meet. You see how that worked out for Mary? My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She knew joy as she was becoming a mother and she also knew that this was the world's great need, this baby that she was bearing. Vocation, you see, is about joy. Mary experienced that joy in knowing that God had chosen her, as frightening as that might have been for her, to bear God to the world, and she wanted to tell somebody about it. I think for a new mom or dad, changing your baby's diaper is a vocation. It's what your child needs. That's the need of the world. And I hope you can do it with joy. <laughs> Not always easy. But this is what the world needs. Joy, the world's need. There's nothing that thrills me more than to talk to people in the church who have who found their vocation in serving Christ. People who feed the hungry. People who volunteer time at Room in the Inn. And if, you did, if you've done that in the past and spent the night with homeless people in one of our churches in the area, you know, the first time you sign up, after you sign up and you realize, I'm on Thursday night, you want to run for the hills. Because you don't know exactly what you're in for, but you know that's what the world's need is, and that you have the capacity, you have the capacity to fulfill that need in the world. That's a vocation. Or at your workstation. It may not seem that that computer terminal is a place of joy or that keyboard, but doing it with joy honestly, faithfully, 
deliberately, carefully, is what the world needs. Earlier today, our children <laughs> thrilled us who were here at the early service, telling us the Christmas story. That's their vocation. They found joy in that. I hope you found joy in it, Sandy. You did, I think. You can tell it by your smile. Found joy in that, and it was the need of those who were here. I had the opportunity earlier this week to get together with some former seminary colleagues. <clears throat> when truth is told, and old seminary types who worked at seminaries and taught there get together, we like to gossip about our students. We like to talk about those who are now pastors and how delighted we are that we would have never guessed they turned out quite that way. <laughs> One of the things we agreed on is that the ones who were at seminary when we were teaching there, the ones who, who kind of wanted to run away, run for the hills, but couldn't get away from God's call, are the ones who find the most joy in their vocation now. Because God just wouldn't let go of them. <laughs> and God kept pulling them back. And hopefully we were a part of that pulling back. Vocation shouldn't be drudgery. Well, sometimes it really is, and sometimes you want to run for the hills like Mary did. But vocation should be wherever it is that we use our gifts, our gifts, for the sake of making the world more Christ-like. Whatever that gift happens to be. Service, baking cookies, extending a handshake, praying for your neighbor, whatever that happens to be. Sometimes people say to me, you're an old guy, why do you keep doing this? You're retired. And I tell you the truth, I do it because it brings me joy. And I love it. You see, this is how God works in the world. This is how God's plan is for you and for me. God chooses ordinary people, Mary, you and me, to bear God's love to the world. God loves people into a relationship with God that sends them back into the world to share that love wherever it may be found. This is not an easy task. There's plenty of hate in the world. Plenty of discouragement in the world. Plenty of reason to run away. But if there's one theme that comes from Advent for us, it is that God does not give up on God's people. God loves us even when we run away. And God won't let go. And God pulls us back to call us anew through the Eucharistic meal, through the gathering of God's people, through the encouragement that we hear from one another. God calls us back to bear that love to wherever we find ourselves. So on to Christmas. Elizabeth and age who tried to run but who were loved by God into vocation and with each other, and those we love, and those you're going to go pick up at the airport, and those you'll see when you arrive at your destination tomorrow or the next day, bearing God's love to the world. A blessed Advent to you one more time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Until